Okay, as I said, we've got quite a short session now, so um, uh, we're just going to focus on um, a couple of key areas, and then we'll, then we'll break for lunch. So the first one up is, and I'm really actually delighted about this, because I think it's a really important area for us, and, um, and Jackie's you know, such, a, such a leading researcher in this area, it's really exciting. So I'd really like to introduce Jackie um, Cole, who's going to talk really about what we're calling Material 4.0, which covers all this area of data, infrastructure, and application. It can be very wide-ranging, so we probably won't cover it all, but we'll touch on some of that now. Um, but also, you know, the real exciting opportunities it affords for us. Um, Jackie's based at Cambridge. Um, where she's head of molecular engineering. Um, she holds a BASF uh, Royal Academy uh, chair in data-driven molecular engineering of functional materials. So that, that says it all in itself. Um, but that carries a joint appointment between Cavendish Laboratories, but also the Rutherford Appleton. So over to you, Jackie. Thanks very much. So thank you very much for the invitation. Hopefully my slides will appear magically. Are they? <laughs> oh, oh, hang on. No, there we go. So uh, I'm going to talk about materials 4.0, or as I like to think, the future of materials discovery with data and artificial intelligence. So this is a picture of Sir Alexander Fleming very famously discovering penicillin by chance. And of course, over the time, we've got a bit better, but still we're using largely trial and error to discover new materials. And in terms of industrial innovation, the, that means the average molecule to market is still about 20 years on average. And it really needs to be drastically reduced if we're going to have innovation that leads to uh, economic growth. So wouldn't it be better if there was a systematic way to do materials discovery. And I'm going to try and show you that there is a way using data-driven materials discovery. So if you're going to do data-driven materials discovery, of course you need data. So let's think, what would be the ideal source of data for materials discovery? You would ideally want, say, the entire universe of all possible chemical molecules that could ever exist. And for each of those chemical molecules, know their cognate materials property. And that's, of course, because there's an inherent relationship between the structure and function of a material. And over the years, people have empirically discovered structure-function relationships. But if we can find a way to encode those relationships in a way that a computer can understand and link that up to a search engine, you could then probe materials and property space so that you could find patterns in the data with help from machine learning and... Once you've got a prediction, ultimately experimentally validate them for your given device application. Strange noise. Um, so uh, that's the dream. But unfortunately, there isn't the entire universe of chemical and property space known. But to a first order approximation, there is, albeit in a highly fragmented form, that chemical and property space in the scientific literature. So that's academic papers, company reports, patents, and so on. And there'll be people in this room. So somebody who's got a paper on one material and its cognate properties. There'll be another person in the room who's got a paper on another material and its cognate properties. But if we were to pull all of that information, grab it all from the documents that ever existed, put it all in together, the sum is greater than its parts of all chemical and property information, then we could mine that information and start to forecast using the historical trends that we have. So that's the essence of the talk. And what we've spent a long time doing is actually writing a lot of software that can mine the scientific literature. So we've written software that mines the text from documents, specific, by the way, to chemical and property information. That's important. Uh, we can mine images. We can mine chemical schematic information, and we can mine chemical reaction information. So those are the names of the four software tools that we've, we've written in my group. And I'm going to talk to you mostly about uh, Chem Data Extractor, the text mining tool. But all four of them uh, will not only grab all of the information, but also put it into 
a database for you automatically. Now, that's really important because, you know, we have to have economics of scale here. So now you have a way of automatically making custom materials databases for your own desired needs, for your own application. And now you've got that database for you. You can, of course, use what's becoming, it seems, traditional machine learning uh, methods to classify and optimize, therefore predict new materials with that data. And once you've got a prediction, experimentally validate them. So let's then look at some uh, applications using the text mining tool, just for purposes of time. And I don't have time to go into the, how it works entirely, but just so you've got a basic idea, what you're putting in as input is you know, any document, you know, as many as you want, thousands, even millions of documents about science, if you had them. And what our text mining tool called Chem Data Extractor will do is it will grab from each of those documents the chemical name information and its paired quantity of property information. That's the property which you have asked of it. And it can be multiple properties. And it will make sure that it pairs the chemical and property information and it will then put it into a chemical database for you. So that's your output. It's open source, by the way. Uh, so we have about 10,000 users, I think, around the world now. And what we've done in my group is we've spent a long time mining, uh, using this text mining tool for certain types of applications. So we've mined, we've made databases of optical materials. So these are you know, multiple thousands. Um, in terms of data records, I'll show you in more detail. We've got batteries, we've got thermoelectrics, we've got superconducting materials, databases, we've got magnetochloric effect databases, we've got stress and strain databases for engineering, we've got uh, uh, semiconducting band gap material, uh, and we've got catalysis databases. They're all open source databases, by the way, so you can all grab them. If you can't find them, let me know, I'll show you where they are. And all powered by Chem Data Extractor, our text mining tool all open source. So I'm going to take a few of those databases, show you how we then apply them to materials discovery. I'm going to start with optical materials, specifically photovoltaics. This is a picture of the sun and a nice environment. And what we're going to do is we're going to set ourselves the challenge of using Chem Data Extractor to find new light harvesting molecules for photovoltaics. This is, this jaggedy line is the solar emission spectrum. And if you think about it just from a, you know, underpinning molecular level, don't, you know, all, all photovoltaic devices differ, but they all have one thing in common, which is you want to grab all of the photons under, under this solar emission curve, right? So what you want is you want molecules that absorb all of the light across that then will track as far as you can the solar emission spectrum. There's not one material that does that. Uh, so the device technologies often combine two, say, molecules to overall get a panchromatic range, um, so like a red absorbing material and a blue absorbing material. So we thought, let's see if we can do this systematically using Chem Data Extractor. And so we made then a database at the time, this was one of our earlier ones, um, of about 10,000 data records of the chemical name, the uh, lambda max, that's the maximum absorption uh, uh, wavelength, and if it was present, also the extinction coefficient for the absorption there. So tracking metrics about the area under that curve, the absorption that you want. And without going through all the detail, um, so we want with 10,000 materials that could possibly be good light harvesting materials, we want to basically find a way to narrow it down all the way to say five lead materials, that sort of number. That's, that's because we want to then take them into experimental validation. So we ask various questions, and we have a sort of pipeline that you go through to, to ask your design questions. For this, we said get rid of all metals. For environmental regulations, we asked a device question. We wrote a mathematical algorithm. We then applied to, say, find kind of com the optimum combination of sort of, if you like, red and blue materials. And then we applied some energy calculations, and that gave us uh, five lead candidates. And we, took, we, we got those materials. We put them into devices. And here is the, the pair of organic molecules that made the best performing uh, light harvesting material. And once in a solar cell device, its power conversion efficiency was 92% that of the industrial standard. The industrial standard is one of the best performing 
um, light absorbing materials for dye sensitized solar cells, which was the type of photovoltaic material uh, uh, device at the time that we used. But that's actually a metal organic material. Remember, you may have spotted here, we got rid of all metals. That made our life a lot harder. So getting 92% of the industrial standard was actually uh, pretty good at the time. I think it was the best organic combination at the time. Other people liked it. It got on the front cover of advanced energy materials. So that's an example of, at the molecular scale, of full design to device materials discovery using data. But chem data extractor can mine anything. Right? It doesn't have to be molecular information. It can mine macroscopic information, for example. So I want to give you another example in the photovoltaics field, but with device data. We made a much bigger database of these two different types of solar cell technology, perovskite solar cells. It's a younger, younger uh, technology, so just under 200,000 data records. And nearly half a million of the much older technology of dye-sense dye solar cells. Right? And those data records contain information, obviously, always of the chemical name, but then of things like voltage, the short circuit current density, fill factor, the uh, power conversion efficiency. So we get nice distributions, but that's helpful if you're designing device uh, uh, physics. And you can go one step further, and it can, you could also get help by mining the technical information, say, in the methods section of the manufacturing process. That could be really helpful if you want to optimize your manufacturing process, right? So you know, say, what was the active area of the, 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 the photovoltaic sort of patch test device that you, you use? What was the solar simulator specifications, right? Because that's going to affect how you optimize your manufacturing. So I'm trying to give you then different, if you like, types of use of chem data extractor in, in the way we combine uh, materials. So that's all I want to say on photovoltaics. Now looking at battery device um, data, we also mined nearly 3,000, um, sorry, 300,000 data records on batteries. And we, again, we're always mining the chemical, and we mined it together with five properties. These are common ones you'd see in the device uh, reporting world, the capacity, the conductivity, the energy, the voltage, and the coulombic efficiency. Um, in case you're wondering what these funny spikes are, Remember, these are experimental data, and this is real, these spikes. And you'll notice they're at kind of unitary or half unitary values. There's a reason for that. It's because, of course, people report a voltage of three. They've rounded up or rounded down, right? <laughs> what they probably meant is it was a bit more, a bit less than three. But, of course, we're reporting the data faithfully. So you might, you know, if there's enough data, put a Gaussian over that. But we're just reporting it as we see it. And... Now, that was, that was the device physics, and again, they could be useful to optimize the device, that type of information. Um, now, with that particular case study, we got all those device properties, but what we couldn't do with the chemical, with chem data extractor at the moment of time, was to say whether the chemical was an anode, a cathode, or an electrolyte. Now, that's, of course, really important if you're a device physicist working on batteries. So what we did is we turned to language models. So we took the original corpus that we had fed into uh, Chem Data Extractor to find all those battery device uh, uh, information. And we specifically selected just the, 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 the scientific documents where we'd had a positive hit on finding ba battery information from within that article. That's then a very battery rich corpus of information. We then fed that into the front end of the language model and uh, then, I guess, I don't want to talk about the details of that, uh, but, you know, it's kind of not quite like GPT. You've all heard of that, at least. Um, it's, we like to think it's a little bit better. But um, uh, it's, the important thing is it's a model of which you can ask questions of it. So, like chat GPT, if you will. Um, uh, but it's fed with our data, battery-specific. So, what that meant, because you can ask questions of it, you could say, what is the anode, what is the cathode, and what is the electrolyte? And once you've got all the, the answers of those questions, you can, put them, you can do that for every single data record of the database, then you can feed it back into the original data set of that nearly 300,000 I just showed you with all that property information. And you can then classify whether the chemical was an anode, a cathode, or an electrolyte. And these uh, histograms show that it works because that's exactly this classification type you would expect. So there's a combination of lots of artificial intelligence and data going on in all of this, and we're finding lots of different ways to do it. And then I just want to then move to thermoelectrics, a smaller database this time, just 23,000. And for this, we, again, always we, we're mining the chemical, but we're, in this case, mining uh, all of these um, uh, properties here. So ZT 
is the, uh, essentially the figure of merit of showing you the performance of a, of a thermoelectric material. And then this is the, then we also mine the Zeebeck coefficient, the thermal and electrical conductivity, uh, the temperature, and also actually the power factor is another parameter, uh, property. And so that, that, they're the distributions you get. You see these spikes again from that rounding effect that I mentioned on batteries. It's the same uh, concept. Um, so what can you do with this? Well, one of the things you can do is, uh, this is a nice example, I think, of forecasting. So, of course, you know, with ZT, right, this is the, the higher ZT, the higher the performance of the thermoelectric material. So, of course, you can point to the highest value and say, well, that's the highest value. Well, if you're working in thermoelectrics, maybe you already know that. But what ChemData Extractor does, don't forget it's mining the literature, we always track, for every data record that we get, we always track the DOI. And what that also means is then we know the year of publication, and we take that all the way through. So what you can do is then you can do sort of basic statistics, say, let's find the average ZT from that distribution I just showed you, and plot it against the year of publication, and you can see the average ZT of the material is going up as a function of time. That shows you're making progress, which is good. So that's one thing, but you can also think, well, you know, if you're in industry, you're thinking, should, I, should we be working on thermoelectric materials? Well, you can plot the year of publication against the number of ZT records, and you can see that actually it's going up quite a lot, quite quickly, in fact. So that might be a good field for you to go and work in. So you can get those sorts of trends using the ChemData Extractor data mining approach. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's like a dot-to-dot -dot game. Uh, this is working on, now we're moving to magnetic materials, and... What we do is we're going, to, it's, we're going to make a database of the chemical, getting bored of hearing that, always the chemical, the Curie temperature and the nail temperature, right? And we've got a big database of that, and you literally just put those uh, dots on, on a phase diagram for a given family of materials, and the red is the Curie temperature, so it's like that's temperature up here, uh, this is the strontium composition of this particular family, and then the blue is the nail temperatures, and of course, I've just joined those dots, and just by joining the dots, I can automatically, if you like, create a phase diagram, right? So uh, we don't really, we, don't, we had no idea, you know, about the, you know, long-term knowledge of, of this family of materials. Um, somebody else who had been working on this field for about 30 years wrote a review and, of course, wrote, sort of drew this nice cartoon of how it's been and their 30 years of wisdom. We had not such you know, no wisdom at all, really, um, but we just joined the dots. And you can see that, actually, it's a fairly good mapping of being able to plot the, the ferromagnetic uh, and antiferromagnetic phases. We missed this little one here, but then we do see this dip. So if you were doing this in real life without the answer, you might then think, oh, well, maybe we should target here in analysis to find a new phase, right? So that's a, another sort of thing you can do with this type of approach. And then finally, uh, we can also do this on superconductors. This is quite a basic example, but uh, uh, you know, if you, you can only get sort of partial information, say in this family where you've, uh, uh, you've mined a whole load of uh, information on, on the critical temperature and the, and the chemical property, and also you link it with molecular information like electronegativity of this lanthanide series. This, these are the, in pink, the, the things that were in the, uh, the scientific literature. And of course, then you can kind of extrapolate if you wanted to know what isn't in the literature that might be out here in terms of critical temperature you might expect. But, you know, that's really just regression, by the way, but people call that machine learning for some reason these days. Um, it's, it's the way it is. Uh, anyway, so I hope that's given you a sort of overview on lots of different types of applications, deliberately chosen, deliberately. I know I've hopped around all sorts of application areas, but just show you the breadth of the different types of approaches you can take to solve material problems. Uh, here is all of our software. I've talked about ChemData Extract to our text mining tool, but we do image mining in various ways. Thank you to my group in particular, but also all my collaborators, uh, the funding, and here's some references in case they're of use. Thank you. I guess um, we've got time for um, a couple of questions. One that came in quite early on, which I think is an interesting one. I, it's not so relevant to the science, but it's much more relevant to the data itself. So it's very much talking about how do you... How do you incorporate, you talked about all this data being open source, it's all stuff you can pull from the industry. Of course, there's a huge wealth of data that's sat there, 
um, in companies. And companies are the, this, I think well, this is one of the dilemmas, companies want to benefit from this and, and they really want to contribute their own data, mm -hmm. but it's that thing about ownership of that data. I just didn't know, I know it's a tricky one, no, but okay. have you got any, any thoughts or comments on that and a, and a way forward which we might break, be able to break that down? So. Yeah, no, it's a super important question. So when I said the data is open source, what we produce in terms of the, our databases of chemical and properties, therefore it's already been extracted from the, the, the literature, that's open source. And that's fine, because we're not breaking any copyright rules by you know, putting out there the chemical and property information that's been extracted. Right? Obviously, we shouldn't be putting out you know, paragraphs of information directly from um, uh, what's in the literature, which I get access to because I've got a university subscription of, the, say, the academic journals. right? Um, so that's, that's important to say. Uh, but that's, once, it's, once it's in a, our database form, in terms of fragmented information put together, that's fine. Um, I think you know, that there's a lot of copyright law um, <laughs> uh, that you have to wade through. Um, one thing I will say about the UK is that the UK does have an exep exemption for, for data mining, uh, text, and uh, table, text and data mi uh, table mining. Uh, which is in our favor, actually. Uh, the, one, the one slight hiccup is that they tried to make it even better in terms of access for everybody, including, I believe, companies. And uh, they put a I think there was a proposal last year that went, went into uh, the government to say, can, can industry mine as well? Uh, and I think it might have just got repealed, um, actually. But it does mean for non-commercial use, you can still mine anything. Um, uh, I think one way for industry to be able to do it if they want to mine the literature is to collaborate with people who are non-commercial and then you can still make these databases and produce them um, and that's not breaking any laws, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a convoluted answer, I suppose, but th there's ways you can do it, but uh, you know, I guess you have to collaborate if you're industry. Uh, but you, I mean, if you're industry and you've got your own data, like your patent information, your company reports, there's nothing to stop you, of course, using Chem Data Extractor. That's, that's under an MIT license, which means literally commercial companies can use all of our software as well. Um, so that's all fine. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, the question came from Suzanne. Where is Suzanne? Hold on. So Suzanne, I should have introduced you. She's, she's actually helping lead on the materials innovation strategy. So she, a lot of you may be hearing from her in the future. And I think, you know, we always see this as one of the underpinning strategies that's going to cut across all materials. And in some ways, we see it as a great opportunity to bring the materials community together in a common way of thinking. But um, in terms of, um, yeah, what we're going to be discussing perhaps with DSIT colleagues is, you know, well, how is that going to work? How is that framework going to work in the big picture? So how do we really benefit from it in the UK as well as internationally? So um, are there any other questions for Jackie? Obviously, Jackie will be in a session this afternoon. Um, but there's one there. Oh, how am I going to throw you that oh, cube in the middle? Oh, you're going to have to shout very loud. Yeah, I could throw it, but I might hit somebody on the way up. <laughs> no, it's just interesting, obviously, this is a, a good way of analysing known data to find connections that have been known before, right? Mm -hmm. How do you apply, what's the scope of the AI methodology to understand the data to inform methodology for development of new materials? Yeah. So go beyond the unknown links that, have, that you knew before, but actually de design methodology. Yeah, so, uh, so I guess of what I've shown, sorry, it went at lightning speed because there's just too much to talk about in terms of the whole of artificial intelligence. Um, so the design to device example I put up with the, the solar cells, that's actually repurposing materials, right? Because these are these, the two lead materials, they've been made before, but purely for scientific curiosity, right? Synthetic curiosity, right? We checked. Um, uh, but then we kind of said, well, look, they could be useful for photovoltaics, and nobody knew that. So you could say, actually, from the last talk, it's a sustainability argument. Actually, it's quite good for us because we don't have to spend all that you know, uh, effort and time and resources to remake them because we know how to do it. So you can say that's a good thing. Um, uh, but you know, then you've got these projections type things. You know, you've got those phase diagrams where we're sort of hinting at maybe we should look here. So it starts to help us design, sort of focus in on sort of areas of phase space, maybe, to look for new things, right? I showed you the example where we had the answer, but we may not have had that answer for a given family of materials. So that's, it should hopefully shortcut that type of thing for, for materials by design. Um, and then, of course, we can project, you know, with those sort of extrapolations. That's less exciting, I suppose, because that's just, say, really regression. Um, 
I didn't talk about generative algorithms. Uh, you may have heard of a lot of those. Uh, that's when you're really making brand new materials, but kind of, uh, again, using sort of uh, variation autoencoders, things like that. We've done a lot of that work. We've predicted new uh, materials for magnetocaloric effects. Uh, we're now in the process of trying to actually experiment and validate those. The one thing I'll say about that is you have to be super careful. There's a lot of you know, trust issues uh, around to suggest that, you know, we have to be, you know, are they real or not, right? <laughs> um, so I, that's partly why I'm just being a bit cautious of what I say on generative algorithms. Some people think that they're just going to tank as a, as a methodology. But, you know, allegedly they will give you um, uh, brand new materials as well. So I think it's a combination of things uh, that we need to work with. Okay, great. Thanks, Jackie. I think we'll stop there. I think you might get a lot of questions uh, sure. later. It's, a really, it's a, obviously a really interesting area, a hot area, but um, thanks very much for that.